let's talk about the sort of game that has been most commonly discussed in the literature and that fascinates people in economics, in political science, in business, in a variety of other fields where people are concerned with how people act together as groups. It's called the prisoner's dilemma. And the classic case is one which really happens. It happens on almost every television show where there are multiple criminals being questioned by the police. It also happens in real life. I once taught this and a student came up afterwards and said, hey, you know, I, a few years ago I got into a lot of trouble with the police and uh, this is exactly what they do. Let's say they've got two prisoners and these people have been caught committing some crime. They suspect they're guilty of a whole series of much more serious crimes, but they can't prove that. So that what they want to do is get the people to confess and implicate one another. Here's what they do. They separate the prisoners and then offer them a deal. They say, look, we've got you. On, we've got enough evidence to convict you on this relatively minor crime, but we're convinced you and your partner are guilty of a whole series of offenses. And this is relatively minor compared to all of that. So we'll offer you this deal. If you confess and your partner doesn't, we'll let you walk out of here free. You'll get good credit for cooperating with the police. You won't get into any trouble. We'll let you off. However, if you don't and your partner confesses, we're going to throw the book at you. We're then going to have enough to convict you on this whole series of much more serious crimes. And so you're going to be in deep trouble. You're going to go to jail for a long time. And so you're thinking, wow, this is bad news. <laughs> um, let's see. If I, I don't know what my partner's going to do. Can I trust that guy? He is a criminal after all. I don't know. Um, let's say he confesses. Then I'm going to be in real trouble if I don't confess and implicate him. If I don't cooperate, then they're going to throw the book at me and I'm going to go to jail for a long time. Oh, that's not good. Um, so I better confess to and implicate him. At least I'll, yeah, I'll still be convicted of that whole series of crimes, but at least I'll get credit for having cooperated with the police. I'll be better off. Now, suppose he decides to remain silent. Well, they've got enough to convict us on this relatively minor crime. We're both going to jail, though not for that long. Now, suppose on the other hand, I talk and he doesn't. He remains silent and I confess and implicate him. Well, then I walk out of here free. So wait a minute. <laughs> if he implicates me, I'm way better off also cooperating and implicating him. And if he remains silent, I'm also better off implicating him. So no matter what happens, I'm better off implicating him. So I better implicate him. Of course, your partner is thinking exactly the same thing. I don't know whether I can trust that person, but if he talks, I'm better off talking. And if he doesn't talk, I'm still better off talking. So I'm going to talk. So each confesses, each implicates the other. They both go to jail for a substantial length of time and they could have gotten off with a much more minor offense and gone to jail for far less time. That is the classic prisoner's dilemma. They both make a choice that makes sense for them. That is their dominant strategy to confess and implicate the other person. But the result of that is an outcome that's bad for both of them. Now, for each player, it's not the worst possible outcome. That's where they remain silent and the other person confesses. But still, it's a bad situation. So let's think about this in a more general fashion. And here, rather than doing what is commonly done in game theory and assigning cardinal numbers to indicate something about the value of staying out of jail or going to jail for a certain length of time and so forth. I'm going to do this in a way that's been studied far less, but I think tells you more about the structure of the game. We're going to look at this in terms of ordinal preferences. That is to say, what's my first choice, my second choice, my third choice, my fourth choice, and so on. Now this eliminates a certain amount of information. And so in doing this, we're making it harder to solve these games. But still, I think what we're doing is illustrating something more important about the abstract structure of this type of situation. And so I think it improves understanding, even though mathematically it makes these much harder to address. Well, here are my two choices, basically. And this is true for any prisoner's dilemma. It happens not just for people who are caught by the police, but it happens all the time in many different social settings. Here is, let's say, me. Here's you. 
two players. And we both have choices. Generally, these are referred to as choices of cooperating with the other person or defecting. So I'll say, I can cooperate or I can defect. And the same thing for you. You can cooperate or you can defect. Now, in the case of the classic prisoner's dilemma, cooperating means cooperating with the other prisoner and remaining silent. And defecting means implicating the other person. Defecting, in other words, uh, betraying the trust of the other criminal, your fellow criminal. So um, it can be confusing because people think of cooperating as cooperating with the police. That's not what it means in this context. And that's part of the reason I don't want to go into too much detail about the actual prison sort of situation. Because the fact is, it's much more generally applicable. And it's better to think of it this way. So, here's what I think. Suppose you cooperate. Well, if I cooperate too, that works out pretty well for me. But if I defect, it works out even better. So, if I defect and you cooperate, that's what's best for me. That's where I walk out of jail free. But, of course, you go to prison for a long time. So, if that's my first choice, <laughs> that's actually your fourth choice. That's the worst outcome for you. But now it's just the reverse. If you defect and implicate me, and I remain silent, then they throw the book at me. That's worst for me, so that's my fourth choice. But that's your first choice. In that case, you get out of jail free. Well, what happens if we both cooperate? That means here we both remain silent. That's pretty good for us, right? I mean, we go to jail on this minor charge, but it's a relatively minor offense. We are not in jail for very long. Whereas if we both defect, if we both implicate one another and betray each other's trust, we're going to jail for a much longer time. So this is the second choice for both of us, where we both cooperate. And then where we both defect, that's our third choice. Now let's think about what these players are likely to do. When I think about this, I think, well, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know whether you're going to cooperate with me or you're going to defect. Let's suppose you cooperate with me. Well, if I cooperate too, I get my second choice. That's not bad. But if I defect, I get my first choice. I'd rather have my first choice than my second choice. So I prefer this outcome. Now, what happens if you defect? You betray me. Well, then I get the worst possible outcome for me if I cooperate with you. I better defect too. That at least gives me my third choice. Now, that's still bad, but it's better than this. So I prefer to do that. Now, notice what's going on here. I am better off defecting no matter what you do. That, recall, is our definition of a dominant strategy. So I have a dominant strategy in this game. My dominant strategy is to defect. I am better off defecting no matter what you do. Now let's look at it from your perspective. You say, well, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what this fellow's going to do. And so suppose he chooses to cooperate. I get my second choice if he cooperates. I get my first choice if I defect. So I get my second choice if I cooperate, but I get my first choice if I defect. I'm better off defecting. So you think, aha, I've got a choice between these two outcomes and I'm better off over here. But now what if I choose to defect? Well, then I get my fourth outcome, you say, if I cooperate. My third best outcome, if I defect. Well, third isn't great, but it's better than fourth. My worst choice. So I am better off defecting. So notice these arrows go in the same direction. And whenever that happens, that indicates that's a dominant strategy. So in short, defecting is the dominant strategy for you. So what can we expect to happen in this game? Well, I am going to play my dominant strategy and defect. You are going to play your dominant strategy and defect. So look at the outcome here. We get that result. Now, neither of us can unilaterally improve it. Notice if I change my mind and move here, ooh, that's worse for me. I can't improve the outcome unilaterally, given what you're doing. If you think, ooh, I, I don't like the, my third choice. I'm going to jail for quite a while. Maybe I should switch. Oh, you can't without making yourself worse off. So this is a Nash equilibrium. Consequently, 
this is where we're likely to end up. But now here's what's significant about this. Notice this is worse for both of us than the outcome where we both cooperate. And so that's a startling fact. Wait a minute. <laughs> we get a Nash equilibrium here, but it kind of stinks. It's a much worse Nash equilibrium than this outcome, and yet this is not a Nash equilibrium. Why not? Why don't we just say, hey, do this? Well, look, I can unilaterally switch and make myself better off. So can you. But of course, if we both do that, we make ourselves worse off. So I can unilaterally improve my situation. This is not a Nash equilibrium. Some people say, look, the solution to this is simple. Just allow the players to communicate. If we can communicate, no problem. We can say to each other, all right, I'm going to, you know, remain silent. I will cooperate with you. I won't cooperate with the police. The other player can say the same. And if we're in the same room together and can kind of enforce that by being there when the other person has to make a statement, maybe that works. But we've communicated. We've said, no matter what, do not confess. Do not implicate me. I won't implicate you. Okay. But then the police take you in that separate room and you've got to make the decision. You start realizing, well, we've agreed to do this, but, but hold on a second. <laughs> Assuming you stay with that agreement, I can make myself better off here. Suppose you're going to betray me. I'm still way better off here. So actually, I better implicate you and betray our agreement. And you can think the same thing. We're likely to end up here anyway. So just allowing us to communicate at certain points during the process doesn't really help. You might have noticed in police shows, sometimes they very quickly separate the prisoners, but sometimes they don't. And that's not really going to be a problem because the same pressure, as long as in the end they are separated when they have to sign those statements. Uh, wow, <laughs> that's going to give them the same pressure toward this. This is the classic case of a prisoner's dilemma. We end up with a Nash equilibrium that is nevertheless far worse than some other outcome. Where does this happen? Well, it happens all the time. Between people, for example, their relationship evolves in such a way that there are certain patterns and that lead them into this Nash equilibrium. It's not great. If they both agreed to change, they could do better, but it's hard for one to improve the situation. It may be impossible for one to improve the, the situation without the other's consent. And even if they both do, there's pressure to go back. So people who try to actually get their act together and reform their relationship or reform their lives tend to fall back into their old ways. And this illustrates in part why. There's strong pressure toward a Nash equilibrium. The same thing happens in international relations. Countries may be in conflict with one another. They may have border skirmishes. They may both spend a lot of money building up militaries. They would be better off if they could agree to an arms control agreement, agree not to spend so much, agree to maintain a demilitarized zone among the countries. But there's going to be an advantage to each to break the agreement. And the same thing is true of a lot of international agreements. It's striking that typically in arms control agreements, uh, climate accords, all sorts of economic agreements, trade agreements, for example, one or the other party ends up violating it. Often both parties end up violating it. Why? They'd be better off if everybody kept the agreement, but each can improve their situation in certain respects by defecting and breaking the agreement. And so what typically happens is agreements that are there on paper but don't have much effect. Most famous example is from the 1920s, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which outlawed war. Well, gosh, <laughs> just a few years later, World War II occurred. And so the signatories to that treaty ended up violating it massively, even with wars of aggression. And that just shows you that as soon as a country thinks, wait, yeah, I've agreed never to go to war, but it's now to my advantage to go to war, they tend to do it. And so we end up in a situation that's far worse. In the case of World War II, one that involves the deaths of millions of people, people would have been much better off maintaining the agreement and never undertaking aggression against another country but that didn't happen. They saw an advantage to be gained by doing it. The same thing can happen in organizations. I may think, hey, it would be great if we all pitched in and work hard on this project, but actually it's better for me if I kind of slack off and work on something else and put the burden on you. Of course, you're better off if you put the burden on me. 
And so what tends to happen in group projects is it'd be best for both of us if we would work together, but actually we both slack off some and hope the other person will pick up the slack. We end up in a situation where neither one of us does much and the project suffers. We end up being in a bad situation. So prisoner's dilemmas arise all the time in a wide array of social interactions. And that leads to a serious problem. What do we do about that? How can we try to get out of this Nash equilibrium and get back into a situation that's better for everyone?